Hello, and welcome back to Feeding His Sheep. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. Now, as I said in the previous study, I've always believed that there's no accidents or coincidences in the Word of God. If you're just speed reading through the pages of the Bible, you might gain an understanding of each individual event, but it may seem as if every encounter or teaching just happened randomly. On the contrary, if you were to take the time to understand the timing and the location of each event, if the, each passage becomes so much richer. It becomes so full of meaning, like understanding why Jesus taught about the gates of hell in Caesarea Philippi. There is actually a place called the gates of hell where the false god or false deity Pan was worshipped there. It helps you understand the context of what was going on. And in scripture, nothing is random. Nothing is by chance. And I firmly believe that every encounter Jesus had with people was not an interruption, but rather a divine appointment, an appointment with a purpose, because something teachable was about to happen. Now, in the last study, Jesus had just used a child as an illustration that it takes childlike faith to enter into the kingdom of God. As Jesus and the disciples left the house that they had lodged in during their time in Perea, Apparently, this young man who appears in the text today was waiting for him. As Jesus begins to leave Perea on his way to Jerusalem, this fellow had spent his entire life depending upon performance and all the things that he could do to get to heaven. Now he approached Jesus to ask what else he could possibly do. Here, right smack in the middle of the 10th chapter of Mark, it looks on the surface as if people are just coming to Jesus as normally the case wherever he went. In actuality, I believe that God ordained a meeting with this man and Jesus to further illustrate that grace and faith in Jesus is the only way to the kingdom. So now let us take a look at a man who had tried every other way possible and still come up short. In Mark chapter 10, we'll begin with verses 17 and 18. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? For no one is good except God alone. Now, if you have a study Bible and you're following along, your page may have a heading that says, The Rich Young Ruler. In each of the Gospel accounts, a detail is given to us about this man, which all combined tell us that he was wealthy, and he was very young, and he was obviously a ruler. So either he was born to a wealthy family, or he's a hustling young man who is shrewd and worked very hard. But it also told us that he was a ruler. Now, I doubt that means he was employed by the Roman government given his loyalty to the law of God. Most commentators tend to think that maybe he was a synagogue ruler, and that makes a lot more sense. And it also adds to his reputation for ambition, because most of the synagogue rulers and elders were not young men. So this man had climbed the ladder quickly and rapidly, so he's, he's got to be on fire. So we see him running up to Jesus. Now, if you remember from the case of the prodigal son, this is unusual and undignified fight in itself. Middle Eastern men of that time did not run. It's considered childish, but his eagerness to get to Jesus surpassed his pride. So that's a good first step. He also showed great humility by bowing before him. So we're off to a great start so far. The conversation between this young man and Jesus starts with something that sounds confusing to us, and it was shocking to those in that day. Number one, he called Jesus good teacher. Or in the King James Version, it says, Good Master. This part was shocking and unusual in those days. The word good was not used flippantly or unnecessarily. Good was a word that was reserved for the Lord God. Now today, we use the English word good for many things. Dinner tasted good. You know, this dog is a good boy. I had a good day. Or as Charlie Brown in the Peanuts cartoon always said, good grief. You know, this wasn't the way things were in that day. The word they used for good meant sinless, flawless, holy. 
Now, personally, I feel disturbed when someone uses the word holy in an empty manner, like holy mackerel or holy cow or something like that. I think that word should be reserved for God and the things pertaining to his kingdom. So while we don't immediately grasp the significance of this man calling Jesus good, the people of that day did. That title was never applied to other rabbis in Jesus' day because it implied sinlessness. Jesus and everyone else else there that day recognized that he was being called by a unique title. There is no instance in the Talmud of of a rabbi being addressed as good master. Only God was called good by the rabbis of that era. Jesus then addressed his question for the young man, which didn't make any sense to many of us the first time or two we read it. But in the context of what the word good is reserved for describing God, now we can understand what Jesus said a little bit better. He says, why are you calling me good? There is none good except God. Now, for the modern reader, we're left puzzled by this. Was Jesus saying that he's not good? Was he saying that he is not God? Jesus was trying to get this man to think. This man had just used a term normally reserved for God. Jesus wanted him to reflect upon his choice of words and determine if he really meant what he was implying by saying that. Now, remember that in that context. If you're calling Jesus good, you're calling him good. God. Only God is without sin, and good in the pure sense of the word meant sinless. So in modern times, Jesus is asking, do you know what you're saying? Are you recognizing me as God in human flesh by calling me good? So things are off to a great start. He approached Jesus eagerly. He humbled himself. He knelt before him. Whether knowing that he did or not, he used a title affirming the deity of Jesus. Then he posed a question about the most important thing that you can ask about, the kingdom of God. All too often, most of the people that approach Jesus asked for temporary things. Now, there's nothing wrong with the desiring to be healed of some sickness or deformity. It's noble to desire that your friends and loved ones be cured of what ails them or delivered some from some demonic oppression as people were bringing, to, bringing their friends and family to Jesus for this over and over throughout the Gospels. In contrast, it's very rare that someone ever cared about eternal matters matters. Every person who was cured eventually died again. Every person that was delivered from something died again. Jairus' daughter and Lazarus, both who were raised from the dead, died again. The majority of people who sought temporary cures for a temporary life, it seemed like no one was concerned about eternity. But this man was. He wanted assurance of eternal life. He came with the right attitude, humility. He came to the right source. He came to Jesus. He asked about the right topic, but he asked in the wrong way. And we can see the flaw in this man's life in the form of his question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In Matthew, he asked, what good thing must I do? This shows his ties to the synagogue and therefore the law and legalism. He thought that salvation was attained by human effort. And what a stark contrast to our previous study with the runny-nosed little kid that Jesus held earlier and said, to such as these belong the kingdom of God. The little children would make it, but this man who had tried every external thing in his own strength and the strength of the flesh trying to make it to heaven is falling short. Grace and faith compared to legalism and human effort. Let's go on and get two more verses in verses 19 and 20. Jesus said, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. So this conversation just gets more confusing. We know as modern believers that salvation is through Christ alone by faith alone. 
The Bible says that. We know that the law was given to us to show what God expects and to show us that we fall short of that and that we need a Savior. Kind of like looking into a bathroom mirror. You see what's wrong and you realize you need to fix it. It's the same thing with the law. It shows you where you fall short of God's expectations. The law never saved anyone. It simply showed us and revealed to us our sinfulness. In Hebrews 10, 1, it says, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Then in Hebrews 10, verses 11 and 12 says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. With that in mind, the young ruler who had just asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life, Jesus gave the response, you know the commandments, and then Jesus listed some of them. Do not murder, commit adultery, do not steal, bear false witness, defraud, and honor your father and your mother. First of all, notice Jesus only listed six. These are the last six of the Ten Commandments. The commandments were handed down originally on two stone tablets. Now, most artists, they've depicted that each tablet has five commandments on each one. That makes them look symmetrical, makes them look even. But if you look in depth, the first four commandments concern your relationship with God, and the remaining six commandments concern your relationship with mankind. A lot of preachers put it this way, the first four commandments are vertical, dealing with God. The last six are horizontal, dealing with life and relationships here on earth. So the tablets were more than likely four and six, not five and five. But why would Jesus say this? Since we know that nobody can perfectly keep the commandments, and even then, if they could, the law would not provide salvation. Was Jesus saying that obedience to these six commandments alone would save this guy? No. What Jesus was doing was probing this man's heart. He was asking this man to examine himself. This man proclaimed that he has upheld those six commandments his entire life. John MacArthur had a study on the rich young ruler, and he titled it The Blasphemy of the Rich Young Ruler. We know that adherence to the law perfectly was impossible except for Christ. But did Jesus just say directly that this man had just lied? Do you see Jesus rebuking this man in the following verses? No, because there's something in this man's life that he was overlooking when he was examining himself. Aren't we good about that when we examine ourselves and look for sin? We often overlook certain things or we'll sweep something underneath the rug. That's what Jesus is digging for with this rich young ruler. He only brought up the law to show this guy that he had not, in fact, kept it perfectly. I also want to point out that despite his best efforts of this young ruler to keep the law he felt incomplete. As obedient as he may have been, even he was aware that something was missing. Everything but faith in Christ is going to leave you falling short of God's mark, and it's going to leave you feeling empty. There is nothing that you can do externally to save yourself, but people keep insisting on trying. If the Bible was to say that admission to heaven was $1 billion, people are going to rob banks and do whatever they could to get that money. If the Bible said that you had to jump over a 12-foot bar, people are going to be in the gym every day working on their leg muscles. But if you tell someone that Jesus has already paid for salvation, that you simply have to have faith in His finished work and follow Him, they don't want to hear that. They feel that they've got to earn it. They feel, they feel like they have to do something to deserve it. The only thing that we sinful humans ever deserve or earn is eternal torment in hell. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. Not me, not you. Let us continue as Jesus probes this man's soul in an attempt to show him exactly where he has fallen in short, despite his being convinced that he has upheld the law and he's a pretty good guy. Verses 21 and 22. 
Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. One thing I don't want anybody to do is to take these verses and think that they apply to everyone. If you haven't noticed already, Jesus does things differently with each individual. He cast out demons in a different manner each time. Each sick person was healed in a different way. Some people were simply told that they were healed, and they were healed. Some had a hand placed upon them. Some had to go and present themselves to the priest. Some were commanded to get up and walk. Some got mud rubbed in their eyes. Some got spit in their face and a finger in their ear. I mean, it was different with every single person. Jesus' command for the rich young ruler to sell all that he had was not not a command for every person to go and do the same. Jesus is pointing out the commandments when questioned by this man it was not a prescription for salvation for everyone, or for that matter, for anyone, this rich young ruler included. Jesus didn't say, sell everything and you will be saved. That's all you're lacking. He says, no, sell everything and you will have treasure in heaven. Jesus followed up with the command to follow him after he completed the task of eliminating his wealth. Following Jesus, having trusting faith, and repenting of one's sins is how you are saved. So why did Jesus say these things to the rich young ruler? Well, I think he'd done it to show him the area in which he was failing. He simply desired to keep his fortune more than he desired a home in heaven. The text says he went away sad. You know, in Luke 16, 13, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. In probing this young man's faith by bringing up his supposed adherence, to the law, Jesus pointed out the sin the man had overlooked. This rich young ruler had another master. Therefore, he was guilty of breaking two of these Ten Commandments here, the very commandments which he thought he had kept. By holding on to his wealth selfishly, he's not loving his neighbor as himself. So there goes that commandment. And there had been another one that he had missed as well, the very first of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Money had become his God. You see, he thought he upheld to the Ten Commandments looking through his own eyes. But if you look through it through the eyes of Jesus, every one of us fails on all of these commandments. What about the time he said, well, you've heard it written that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at a person lustfully in your heart, you've already committed adultery. He said, you've heard it said that you do not commit murder. But if you've ever been angry with your brother, you have committed murder. So we cannot hold up to the Ten Commandments. This young man thought he was doing good by his objectives, looking through his eyes. He upheld the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. He was told he also to love his neighbor as himself and have no other gods before God, and he had failed in both of these. Money had become his God. He may not have literally bowed down before piles of gold or silver. Maybe he didn't have his wealth on a shrine and he bowed and prayed to it every day, but it was a God to him. It was what he felt he needed to trust in to make it through this life. That's what made it become a God to him. It may have helped him get through this life a little bit easier. Money does grease the machine of society that we live in. Money will get you into better schools, and that's going to get you a better job in life. Money's going to get you better medical treatment. Money's going to make your vacation and leisure time longer and more memorable. Money can bring you comfort and ease, but there are many things that money cannot do. Money can buy you a house but not a home. What good is a big mansion and all this glorious estate and everything if it's full of emptiness and loneliness inside or if there's bitterness and coldness within? Money can buy you people who call you a friend while you're wealthy, but ask the prodigal son what happens when you run out of money. All the friends gone. Money actually makes finding true love more difficult, I believe, because how would you ever know if the person that you're with loves you for who you are instead of your 
your wealth. I seen a meme going around about this very unattractive guy has a supermodel on his arm and this it said he's on a winning streak. Not only did he win a twenty million dollar lottery, he also found the love of his life the same day. Yeah, come on. Money cannot buy you a place in the kingdom of God either. All of these prosperity preachers on TV, they're trying to say if you send them a thousand dollars, God's gonna bless you abundantly and you're going to get rich in return. To say that you have to buy the favor of God is a lie straight from hell. And to extort these poor people out of their meager money in order to get rich from promising them a seat in heaven buys you a seat in hell as well. I shouldn't call out names here, but I can't help but wonder how Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland would react if Jesus were to personally tell them to give away their millions and to follow him. Like the rich young ruler, I tend to think that they'll probably walk away very sad just like he did. One more thing before moving on. Did you catch the first part of verse 21? Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. I wonder what it was that gave Jesus a fondness for this man. I can tell you it's not his wealth that impressed our Lord. Our God owns it all. Everything belongs to him. It's his world that we're living in. To claim that we own anything is like two fleas on a dog's back arguing about which one owns the dog. Gold and silver and money were here long before we are, and they're going to be here long after we're gone. So it's kind of pointless to put so much stock into something that we can't take to heaven, something that's not even going to get us to heaven in the first place. But something in this man made Jesus fall fond of him. Maybe it's his humility at first or the eagerness with which he sought Jesus. Maybe it was the spark of recognition by calling Jesus with a name that's only attributed to God. Or maybe it was the seeking desire for things eternal. Out of all the earthly temporal requests that people made of Jesus, maybe it's just refreshing that someone desired something of eternal importance for a change. Usually when someone else brought up the kingdom of heaven, it was only the Pharisees and the Sadducees trying to trap him. So maybe it's the, the seeking heart of this man that Jesus loved. But the rich young ruler walked away saddened, unwilling to part with his idol of wealth. He was so close to heaven, but he turned down an eternity of blessing for just a few more years with his stuff. Stuff that rusts, deteriorates, gets stolen, and gets lost. It's such a terrible tragedy. I think that Jesus, just as Jesus felt love for this young man, he probably also felt the sorrow as the young man walked away too. For in the very next verse, Jesus looks around as this man is walking off and begins a deeper discourse into the matters of wealth and its proper place in our heart. Let's go ahead and cover verses 23 through 27. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard will it be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Corey Ten Boom once said, I try to hold on to things loosely so it doesn't hurt my fingers if God decides to rip it away from me. We have just seen a man who had his heart so tied securely to his possessions that he walked away from the kingdom of heaven in order to hang on to them for just a little while longer. The rich young ruler is a tragedy only because it wasn't necessary. Not everyone was commanded to do what he was commanded to do. That was an individual case because his money had become an idol to him. It had become a god. He wasn't told that he would never get to heaven. He was simply asked to love God more than anything else. The greatest command in the Bible was given in a discourse that's found in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 22, 37. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul and with all your mind. But all too often when possessions reach a certain point, they become a god in the heart of their owner. I guess you could say the possessions become the owner of the person instead. That's why Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. He didn't say it was impossible, just hard. This tells us that being wealthy is not a sin, but desiring to keep it regardless of the consequences That's a sin. There have been plenty of rich people throughout history that have served God. One of the first examples, you know, gives us his brand new unused tomb to be used by Jesus after the crucifixion, a tomb which had never been used and therefore undefiled, something that was very costly. Or how about the case of the alabaster jar of perfume that was poured out to anoint the feet of Jesus? That perfume, we're told, is worth a year's wages. This woman had brought her absolute absolute best and most expensive item to pour over a more than worthy Savior. She denied herself of her most valuable possession and gave Jesus everything. Now there's numerous examples of the wealthy still being godly people, but the norm is the opposite. They may still be great people. They still may do good deeds and donate to people and never break any laws. The problem arises when they place their trust in what they have instead of placing their trust in God. For example, let's imagine a tithe being given. Suppose you were poor and you worked odd jobs here and there trying to make ends meet, and you only brought home $100 a week. Now, 10% of that would be $10. That's going to hurt, but it's still doable. You're, at this point, forced to fully rely on God to meet your needs at this level. There's no way you can do it on your own. You have to depend on God. Now, imagine you find a slightly better job. You're making $500 dollars a week at this job. Giving $50 as a tithe is not exactly going to bankrupt you. You still have plenty to work with, and you still have to rely on God as your provider to some extent. Now let's say somebody found oil or a gold mine in your backyard, and or maybe you invented something useful or you wrote a hit song or something, and your income went up to $100,000 a week. Now does that seem like that's a lot? Yes, it does. But all of a sudden, would writing a check to the church for $10,000 every Sunday seem like a bit much, even though you have $90,000 a week left over? Now let's say you took this wealth and and it multiplied through sound investments. Let's use for an example an unimaginable amount. You now make a million dollars a week. At that point, you begin to rely on yourself more than God, if you even remember God at all. Now, making a million dollars a week, could you write a a check to the church every every Sunday for $100,000 without flinching, even though that you're never going to be able to spend everything else. After all, cutting out that amount means you're making less than a million now. Uh, Maybe you're okay with giving that amount. Maybe you've given extra to other charities. That's great. But now imagine Jesus showing up on your front porch asking you to give it all away and he'd come with him as he approaches Jerusalem and face a hostile crowd. And when he says, follow me, that means you're giving up your life of luxury. You're giving up all of this money, all of this income, and now you're going to go face persecution and possibly a cross next to him. What are you going to do? You see, being wealthy is not a sin. And at the same point, giving it all away does not save you. Being poor already does not mean that you're saved. It just means you don't have the stumbling block of riches tripping you up like some people do. You still have the rest of your filthy sins that need to be dealt with without having to worry about wealth and greed so much. Jesus further elaborated with this expression, It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, some teachers have come up with this idea that this refers to a literal gate. They say that when the big city gates were closed at night, there was a tiny door next to it called the eye of the needle. And supposedly, they said to get a camel through that door, you had to strip all of the cargo off of it, force it to kneel, and to crawl on its knees. Now, the only thing that I have ever found that mentions this was my old 1962 Wycliffe Bible Commentary. We have the names of the gates 
of Jerusalem, the fish gate, the sheep gate, the dung gate. There is no eye of a needle to be found. No historical records ever mention such a place. And why would they not just wait until the big gate was open anyway? Now, i got to admit, it does make a great illustration, this made-up story of an eye of a needle, about having to rid yourself of a spiritual baggage and humbling oneself, and it's like the camel would have to crawl through on its knees. But I simply cannot teach in good faith that such a place exists. There is no evidence of it. So that leaves the possibility that this was the use of metaphorical language. It was meant to sound silly and impossible because it is silly and impossible. That was the point. Jesus uses those kind of illustrations quite frequently. For example, Matthew 7 verse 3. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Did the disciples literally have logs in their eye? Were there any records or findings of a chunk of timber extruding from the eye socket of anyone? No. If they literally had logs in their eyes, well, for one, Matthew would be measuring the log for taxation. Judas would sell his log for 30 pieces of silver. Thomas would refuse to believe that he had a log in his eye. James and John would be arguing over whose log was the greatest among them. I mean, this is just silly. Verse 24 says they were amazed. Verse 26 says they were astonished when Jesus said it was difficult for a well person to enter the kingdom. Why did that leave them so confused? In that culture, they believed that great wealth was a sign of God's favor. And at certain times in the Bible, that concept was true in a sense. Abraham was a wealthy man. He was blessed by God, and so was Solomon. Were Abraham and Solomon sinless and deserving? No. Were they blessed by God directly? Yes. So the concept was seen through many of the minor prophets that we've studied. God told them the things that they were lacking when insects and drought destroyed their crops. And he told them he was trying to get their attention, trying to get them to turn from sin. And if they would walk with him, things would go smoother. So in the minds of these 12 Jewish disciples, they truly believed that wealth was a sign of God's favor. But that was not always the case. Sometimes people made a profit from exploiting the poor. Amos referred to the wealthy Israelite women as fat cows of Bashan and rebuked them for oppressing the poor. And then there's Zacchaeus, who was the chief tax collector of the trade hub at Jericho. As a result, he was rich and powerful at the expense of his own people. Zacchaeus was viewed as a traitor. Matthew himself was among the same kind. The difference is is that when Jesus told Matthew, follow me, that meant leaving that cushy job that was earning him lots of money. You know, Matthew was probably still thought of in a bad way the rest of his days by his own people for that job, even though he left it. And I think we don't reflect enough on what Matthew left. In order to become a tax collector, you had to pay your own money in a bid on a certain region or area. The Roman government would say, for example, for this parish right here, they or this county, they wanted to have $100,000. So a tax collector would pay $100,000 to get that area, and then they could go and collect 150000 or they could collect 200000 if they wanted to, and keep keep the rest, as long as Rome got the amount that they wanted. So Matthew had to invest a lot of his money to get his booth and the region that he was in. We don't know how long it had been since the auction, so he may not have gotten any of his investment back. So not only did he walk away from uh, lucrative income, Matthew also walked away from a large investment. He really did leave a lot. So when it said, follow me, it meant leaving that cushy job that earned him lots of money. And and he didn't receive much reward for it. He was probably still viewed as a tax collector, even though he left it. Now compare Matthew with the rich young ruler. Matthew's name is going to be on the foundations of the eternal city, along with the other disciples who had left everything and followed Jesus. Revelation 21, 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Well, what about the rich young ruler? 
Well, he enjoyed the next few years of his life in luxury and still had no assurance of salvation. He spent the rest of his days with uneasiness and uncertainty any time he pondered eternity. We're not told if he ever came around, but unless he took his eyes off of himself and took his eyes off his riches and looked to Jesus for salvation at some point, he likely heard the same words that Abraham told the rich man who died in the account of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. In Luke 16, 25, but Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. All of this left the disciples with so many questions. If wealth was not necessarily a sign of God's favor, what was? If this person who had wealth had a position in the synagogue and upheld the commandments better than most people is not going to make it to heaven, who then could be saved? And if someone had given up all they had to follow Jesus, what could they expect? Jesus addressed that in these next few verses, and we'll close with that. But the answer to most of those questions was summed up in verse 27. With man, it's impossible. You cannot earn salvation. You cannot buy salvation. You don't inherit salvation from your parents. Salvation is only possible through God by His Son. Let's go on into verses 28 through 31. Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers, children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. We said earlier that Matthew left his tax booth to follow Jesus. That's something he's never going to get back. Zacchaeus, who we'd mentioned earlier, did at least some of what Jesus asked the rich young ruler to do. It wasn't the entire amount, but he gave it of his own free will without being commanded to. In Luke 19, verses 8 and 9, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. But I have to ask about what Peter gave up. He left his home in Capernaum, but they'd returned to it several times in the course of the ministry of Jesus. He had left his wife behind in the home, but later on, after the resurrection, she joined him in proclaiming the gospel throughout the land. We can see this in the writings of Paul as he mentions it. Peter had left his fishing boat and his nets behind. After the crucifixion, but before Christ arose, Peter's at a loss for what to do, so he returned to fishing. So true, he had given up some things, but so far, most of that could be picked right back up again. But Jesus doesn't rebuke Peter. In fact, he gives assurance to him because Peter was willing to leave everything behind had he been asked to. Peter even faced crucifixion for serving our Lord. He was more than willing to sacrifice everything. So Jesus gives him and the others assurance. And that assurance carries over to us today. What Whatever you give up for the Lord will be returned to you in many forms, many times over. He also said something that may need some clarification here. He will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, farms, along with persecutions in the age to come and eternal life. The receiving more than we sacrifice part, we can understand, you know, in the millennium and in the eternal city of heavens afterward. But in this life as well, well, I mean, prosperity preachers, they want you to give to God so much that it hurts. And they're going to say, if you give generously, God's going to make you rich. That's not how this works. You don't give in order to get. Some of you may be rewarded with stuff in this life as well as the next. But the rewards in this life may not be in the way that you expect. How are you going to receive a hundred times as many houses as you surrendered in this life? Well, I've done a little research on that. And according to Google, as of 2023, 
2.6 billion people claim the Christian faith. Now, I can't see that as being accurate given the current state of the world and the direction that society is going. I dare say that at least half of that 2.6 billion people are not saved but self-deceived, as the rich young ruler was. But okay, let's cut that number in half, 1.3 billion. There are still 1.3 billion people that's going to give a brother or sister in Christ a place to stay in the event that they surrendered everything. If they devoted their lives to the gospel, they're always going to have a place to stay. God will take care of and provide for those that are doing His will. He does it with His missionaries all the time. But we must be doing so out of a heart that seeks after God. This is the one thing the rich about the rich young ruler that Jesus loved. He wanted to do what was right. He wanted to please God. If only he could have. But in order to do that, in order to please God, you've got to die to yourself. You have to take up your cross. You've got to stop looking out for yourself. Stop worrying about stuff. Stop obtaining stuff for yourself that holds no lasting value. And put the needs of others first. Not only did the rich young ruler have another God before the one true God, he also neglected to love his neighbors as himself. He put his needs first instead of the needs of others. That's something that Jesus addressed in the final verse of today's study in verse 31. But many who are first will be last and the last first.